Okay, ZWO has been kind enough to loan me not only the AM5N, the new version of the AM5 mount, but also the TC40 carbon fiber tripod, as well as the PE200 Pier for the tripod. Obviously, I've already got this out of the box. First thing you'll see is it comes with a test report for the periodic error. Each individual mount is individually tested and you get a report with it. Mine actually shows that it is coming in at a maximum periodic error of nine arc seconds and a minimum periodic error of 3.4 arc seconds. So that comes in under their advertised 10 arc second or less the periodic error also in this envelope is like a little quick start guide to get you going with their sky atlas app it used to be called the asi mount app so that leads me into my next thing i'm a nina user for my acquisition software so i'm not going to be covering how to connect this to the asi air i'm also not going to be covering the sky atlas app that they have so we're going to focus on not only going over the features of the mount i'm also going to be testing it with my edge hd8 mounted on top of this thing in three different configurations one with the Hyperstar, one in the native configuration, and then one with the Celestron 0.7X reducer. I will leave a link for the Athcom drivers in the description below. It's a pretty straightforward install. I'm also an affiliate now with ZWO, so if you decide to purchase one, if you use the link in the description, I'll get a little bit of a kickback and more cost to you, so that's a great way to help support the channel. I'm gonna start this video by going over the specs. We're gonna get a little bit deep on the max payload capacity part of everything, but I think it's worth knowing what I've discovered with the advertised load capacities from ZWO. So let's get into it. My name is Rich and you're watching Deep Space Astro. All right, so straight from ZWO's website, we're going to look at the specifications of the new AM5N mount. Obviously, this is a German equatorial mount. Um, you can run it in equatorial mode as well as alt as mode. Uh, some of the more important features of it is the, the periodic error is less than 10 arc seconds. The payload capacity with outer counterweight is 15 kilograms or just a little bit over 33 pounds or with a counterweight is 20 kilograms which is just a little bit over 44 pounds the mount weight itself is five and a half kilograms which is a little over 12 pounds we do have latitude adjustment range from zero to 90 degrees the azimuth adjustment range is the the range from the center of the mount where you make your adjustments in azimuth with the left and right side knobs you can go six degrees either way dovetail all can accommodate Laos Mandy or Vixen. This is a 12 volt unit, so there are actually two power ports on the AM5N. The front one is a 12 volt at 5 amps. Uh, the 3 amp reference they're making here is the additional port that's actually in the saddle, and we'll go over that as well later in the video. The mount does not come with a power supply, so keep that in mind. You'll have to provide your own power to the unit. Um, it does have the ST4 guiding port, so if you're using some software that requires an ST4 port, you still have that as an option. Communication, they've included Bluetooth in this version, where previous versions were just USB and Wi-Fi. So there's been an improvement with the operating temperature on the low side as well. The mount can now run as low as minus 20 degrees Celsius, which is minus four degrees Fahrenheit, up to 40 degrees Celsius or 104 degrees Fahrenheit. Another thing to note is the power off brake, which only exists in the RA access. There is not a brake in the declination access, but in the RA access, if you happen to lose power while it's slewing over to one side or the other in some precarious position, other mounts without a brake, you can have what's called back driving and the gravity will take over. You lose power and the gravity of your scope and equipment that's leaning over far enough will just start pulling that stuff down and it'll start spinning around, possibly crashing into your tripod legs. There's a built-in brake in the RA axis that prevents that from happening. It'll engage when there's no power and keep everything in place. So let's take a closer look at the max load capacities of the AM5N. Without a counterweight, it can handle up to 15 kilograms. With a counterweight, that increases to 20 kilograms. So if you're using a counterweight, the first thing to point out, the counterweight should be secured on a counterweight bar of no more than 25 centimeters in length. And they show that here. So the center line of the right ascension of the mount, the distance from that point to the center line of your counterweight should not exceed 25 centimeters. The counterweight, they also, in this example, and what they support as per item number two here is a five kilogram counterweight. So that's important because that all works into the math. The one thing that you notice in both of these illustrations is the 20 centimeter distance that they're showing here. So they're showing from the center line again of right ascension on the mount to the center line of your optical tube is 20 centimeters. So that is where they derive the 15 kilograms and the 20 kilograms from. And I did confirm all of this that we're gonna go over with ZWO. So the 15 kilograms without the counterweight and the 20 kilograms with the counterweight are correct if your distance between these two center lines are 20 centimeters. 
if that 20 centimeters increases, your max load capacity decreases. And it decreases quite significantly. So I feel it's an important thing to know about, especially if you're thinking about purchasing one of these. You can do some math ahead of time and make the determination if it's a good fit for you and your equipment. So my next step was, was to try to figure out how I can determine what my max load capacity would be when those centerline distances between the mount and the scope increase from 20 centimeters. So this is what I came up with with some help from ZWO. Once I had this all worked out, I did send this over to them and they confirmed that it was correct. So the, the first example we're going to go through here is to validate the 15 kilograms and the 20 kilogram that they have listed on their website for max load capacities. Some things to keep in mind is, first of all, there are other variables that aren't easily plugged into a formula because they can change from setup to setup, specifically anything that you have mounted on top of your telescope. So maybe you have another dovetail and then your mini PC or ASI Air or like myself, I've got, I also have a Pegasus power box and my power hub. I included all those devices in my total weight, but the part that I can't account for is how it changes my center line. So this is what I'm talking about here. This is my Edge HD 8 inch. I included weight for the dew shield, everything that we got riding on top, uh, my OEG with the camera and my main imaging camera. But the center line of the scope now technically moves up slightly because of the stuff that I have stacked on top. You know, so the, and the assumption would be that space up here that causes that center line to shift is gonna have a different weight than just a section of that same space of the telescope. So it's not gonna be an exact number, but the formulas will give to you a more accurate number as far as your max load capacity. So keep that in mind as you're working these numbers out that what you have riding on the top, you can include it in the weight, but it may affect your center of gravity of the scope itself. So for the formulas, we're just going to assume that there's nothing on the top of the scope, just as ZWO does. And these are their numbers right here where they got their 15 kilograms and 20 kilograms from. So first of all, we'll just go over what some of these values are. So Newton meters, 30 Newton meters, that again came from ZWO's graphic on their website. You can see right here under item number one, maximum output torque is 30. So that's where that number comes from. Our center line distance, 20 centimeters. Again, that's what they're showing here, center line to center line. And then the acceleration of gravity, which is 9.81 meters per second per second. So the first part of it, we're gonna try and figure out what our max load capacity is without a counterweight. So we're gonna take 30, which is our Newton meters from their website, and we're gonna divide that by 0.2, which is our center line distance. They show it in centimeters. The formula requires it to be in meters, so it's 0.2. That leaves us with 150 newtons. I believe newtons is the correct unit. Again, I'm not a mathematician by any stretch of the imagination, but um, even if that's the incorrect unit to be calling that out as, the 150 is the number that is important and that we need. So we take that 150 and we'll divide that by the acceleration of gravity, which is 9.81, and that leaves us with 15.29 kilograms, right? That's their max load capacity without a counterweight. So that number checks out. They just rounded it down slightly. To figure out the max load capacity with a counterweight, which is 20 kilograms, we've got a couple more formulas to go. So in this formula, CW is the counterweight, which is a five kilogram counterweight. Again, G is the acceleration of gravity. CWD, I listed as the counterweight distance, the 25 centimeter, again, back on their graphic right here, center line of the weight, center line of the mount. And M, again, stands for Newton meters. And then D, the, the center line distance between the mount and the optical tube. So our first formula is CW, which is our counterweight, five kilograms. Acceleration of gravity, 9.81 times the counterweight distance, which is 0.25. And that gives us 12.26 Newton meters. So then we're going to take our 12.26 and move it down into our next formula. So 12.26 divided by 9.81 times 0.2, and that leaves us with 6.24 kilograms. Now it's just simply adding the two numbers together. So we're going to take our 6.24 kilograms, and we're going to add it to our max low capacity without a counterweight. And that comes out to 21.53 kilograms. They're advertised as 20. I was kind of happy to see this. A lot of companies like to round numbers up in their favor and ZWO actually went the other direction with this. Again, sent this to ZWO and they confirmed this was correct. So my next step was to work out the numbers with my Celestron Edge HD with all my gear on it 
which came out to approximately 10 and a half kilograms. We're gonna still use a lot of the same numbers. I won't go through everything. You can see the numbers in green. With the weight of my gear and my centerline distances, without a counterweight, I came in at 13.29 kilograms. And with a counterweight, I came in at 17.69 kilograms. So there was a little bit of a drop in max load capacity because of that centerline distance increasing from 20 centimeters to 23. I just want to go over quickly how I figured out my centerline distance versus just trying to hold a, a tape measure up to it and eyeballing it. This is a more accurate way of doing it. So again, I'm at 23 centimeters. First start with this graphic. ZWO sent this over to me. The dimension that I have the arrow drawn to you can see is the center line of the mount to the top of the saddle and that's 122.3 millimeters. The next number that we need is half the diameter of the scope. My scope is an 8 inch comes in at 203.2 millimeters. So that's actually 101.6 millimeters for half that diameter. The third and final number that you need is the distance from the top of the saddle to the bottom of your scope. I got my calipers in there the best that I could. So I'm relatively certain I'm at eight millimeters and maybe plus or minus a little bit, but so we just add those three numbers together and that got me to my 23 centimeters converted to meters is 0.23 because again, the formula requires meters. So just plugging the numbers in properly, like I said, you can see how our max loads both without the counterweight and with the counterweight dropped. So just keep that stuff in mind as you're trying to figure out whether or not the AM5 is going to be a good mount for your setup for your telescope. Okay, so uh, we have a new case versus the old one like with the zippers that we used to have it on there. I did a video on the comparison between the two AM5 and the AM5N. I'll leave a link up here if you haven't seen that video yet. But this is kind of like a suitcase, so it just unlatches the hard foam, nice and rigid. And inside we have not only the mount, but also the hand controller, cable for the hand controller. We have a USB-A to USB-B cable for controlling the mount from the front of the unit. And there is also a USB-A to USB-C cable to control the mount from the USB-C port that is on the saddle. So let's get this out and take a closer look at it. And we'll just start with going over what we see on the front of the unit here. So we have our USB-B connection where you can control the mount from. You have your auto guide port, your ST4 port, if you have a need for that. The port mark HC is for the cable for the hand controller. And then we have our DC 12 volt in. There's also a Bluetooth button on here that can be used to not only connect your phone to the Sky Atlas app, but I believe you can also connect via Bluetooth Bluetooth from your ASI Air as well and control the mount. So that, that would eliminate a cable going from the mount to the ASI Air as well. If we flip it around, you can see on both sides, we have our altitude locks. So we would loosen both sides of these and then adjust our altitude simply by spinning this bar. Now, once this gets to 60 degrees, it's gonna hard stop on you. If you have a need to go higher than 60 degrees, it's easy enough to do. There's an included Allen wrench in the side here that's magnetically held in place. So if we pull that out and on both sides see if i can get it in the camera here for you guys but there is a bolt on here and the same one on the other side you simply loosen both of these bolts and you don't need to take them all the way out just give them two or three turns to get them nice and loose and now with that loose you can see i can now go past 60 all the way to 90. at that point i would just tighten those bolts that we just loosened back down and that would be my max range so we're just going to tighten those back up i believe it at the default 60. your azimuth controls are as you would expect and i'm in both directions depending on which way you want the whole thing to rotate when it's on the mount when you're polar aligning there are no azimuth lockdowns on the side like they used to be on the old version those have been removed because they have a new system on the bottom it looks like there's some a set of bars and springs that keep tension on the base so as you're making those adjustments it keeps it locked in place automatically so that's really nice on the saddle we now have power pass through so we take 12 volts into the front and then those same 12 volts will come up out of the saddle which could go up to your asi air or or your mini PC or anything that you need to power that's running your acquisition software. There's also a USB-C port here, as I mentioned before, right on the saddle. So you can also connect to that to control the mount, whether that's your ASI Air or your mini PC running something like Nino, like I am. So everything stays up above the mount. So you don't have to use them. You don't have to do it that way. You can absolutely just power it from the front and control it from the USB port. Um, it's up to you, but it's nice to have everything up on the saddle in declination and there's no cable 
tables that get snagged up on. On the back side of it, the screw comes out. So if you need to use a counterweight, that's what you would screw this into. Slide your counterweight on so you can get to that higher max load capacity that they advertise at 20 kilograms, about 44 pounds. So with my setup, you guys will see here later in the video, with my Edge HD 8 inch, per the specifications, I do not need to run with a counterweight. So I am running it without a counterweight. So that's pretty much the mount as far as the physical aspects are concerned. Let's talk about the tripod now. So as I mentioned before, this is the TC40 tripod, carbon fiber. The legs do extend out so we can go higher. I'm going to leave it short now just so you guys can see what I'm doing here. It comes with the adapter plate that goes on the bottom of the mount and all your connection pieces. And I'll show you how to, how to put all this together. But we've got the rod that goes up through the center. We've got the leg spreader also. It also comes with a, a rock bag, a weight bag, if you will, that you connect in between the legs to put extra weight in the middle of everything to keep it more steady because this is a light mount. You don't have to worry about balancing your telescope when you put it on the mount, obviously. But what you do may need to worry about as you put a larger scope on is the, the, the literal balance, right? If it's, it's starting to lean over to one way, the mount doesn't care that it's not balanced, but you don't want it going like this. or you don't want it being just on the verge of somebody bumping it and it being knocked over. So putting a weight in the, in the rock bag right in the center will help pull everything down and keep that more secure for you and also ship with three allen keys and three spikes for the tripod legs i will be using the spikes so um i'll show you how to put those on it's nothing that really needs any instructions to do but you can see each of the spikes what they look like you just unscrew the rubber feet off of the bottom and then the spike goes in its place and rinse and repeat on all three sides and i'm putting the spikes on because i'm not setting up on my concrete pad right now so i will be setting up in the yard in the grass so the the spikes help keep things even more secure for me versus just letting them sit on the rubber feet. So before we actually get the mount on here, I do want to mention that the total weight is 2.3 kilograms or about 5 pounds. Max low capacity is 50 kilograms or 110 pounds. So for something as light as it is, it, it certainly can handle the weight for you. So time being, we're just going to set the tripod to the side and your mount will come with three screws pre-installed in the bottom of the plate. So again, using the provided Allen wrench that is tucked inside the base, um, um, these should just be hand tight. If not, that's what this is for to take them out. So you just want to remove the three screws that you have in the bottom of the plate and then take the provided plate that came with the tripod. Just put it on the bottom of the mount plate using the same screws that we just pulled out. And then with the plate in place, now we're ready to mount it onto the tripod. It's just easy just setting it right on top of the tripod. It'll fall right into place. So you're going to take the threaded rod that came with the unit and you'll see there's a smaller thread on one side as far as length is concerned and a longer thread on the other side. You want the smaller side to go up into the center of the mount and that'll secure it to the plate. And then we're going to take our leg spreader, push that through the rod up in place, make sure your legs are spread out as much as possible. And then the retaining nut will go right on top of that on the longer threads in the bottom and secure it in place. The last thing that you want to do, turn this around so you can see it, there is a retaining lock right here. So you want to make sure you twist that all the way in the direction that it's showing that it's locked. That's just extra security. It grabs onto the outside diameter of the mount of that plate that we put on there to keep everything secure so now the mount's ready mount it to the tripod and we'd be ready to go and start shooting but we have the pier to talk about so i'm going to take this back off and show you how to put the pier on it's just as simple as putting on the plate for the am5 unit so i'm going to take all this stuff off again and we will set the mount aside for now the pier comes with the same plate that we just put on the am5 already attached to the bottom of it sits in that hole like that then the same thing that we just did with the mount we're going to take the short end of the rod and thread it up through the middle take our tripod leg spreader put that back in the place and then again with the nut secure everything and tighten it up so we get those legs spread out as far as we can and then again make sure our, our retaining lock is turned towards lock position to get that secured to the tripod and you'll notice we have retaining locks on the pier as well there's three of them there's one here one there and one on the other side so same concept we're going to take the mount, place it on the top of the pier, and then lock it into place with the retaining locks. And that's it. We got the mount on the pier and the tripod. So, so um, we got to mention also the weight of the pier. It comes in at 1.6 kilograms, which is three and a half pounds. And just like the tripod, the max load is 50 kilograms or 110 pounds for the pier. Other things known about the pier is it is also compatible with the 1.75 inch steel tripods from Ioptron and Skywatcher, as well as a two inch tripod from Celestron Advanced VX mounts. And that's all made possible with this little adapter that they give you as well as the needed bolts to attach those so if you have one of those tripods and you wanted to use the pier for that you can as well okay so that covers everything about the mount pier and tripod ready to get the telescope mounted on this thing get it out
outside and I want to show you some more functionality and features of the mount. Then I'm going to do some multiple night testing first with my Hyperstar, then in the native configuration. And then we'll do some testing with the Dot 7X reducer. Okay, the first thing that you want to do is to make sure that you have the latest firmware. And the latest version as of time of recording is 1.5.7. So I would highly recommend that you update the firmware first before trying to use it. There's new features that are in the latest version that may not exist in this version. So um, again, I'm using Nina, so I'm using the ASCOM. You can do the firmware upgrade right through the ASCOM driver. You can also use the phone app or obviously the ASI Air as well. But because I'm using Nina, we're going to use the ASCOM driver to do this. Just simply click the firmware update button and then click the online update. Give it a few minutes. It'll download it, install it, and we'll come back as soon as it's done. Okay, firmware is done. It says it's complete and the device will restart. So we're just going to close the dialog. It reconnected. You can see the firmware version is now up to 1.5.7. Okay, another thing I wanted to cover, and it's sort of related to the max low capacity, but not entirely, is something called heavy duty mode. I apologize for the screenshot of an actual tablet screen here. This was a friend of mine that was shooting and she just quickly opened it up so I can take a quick snapshot so I didn't get it framed up properly. But you can see here heavy duty mode and the little help tip for it says to improve the low capacity of the ASI mount in low temp environments. So what this will do is it'll be helpful if you're approaching your max low capacity and it increases that by 40%, but it also in turn decreases the maximum speed of the slew by 50%. Now this is not a way to increase your max low capacity, meaning if you're right at the edge of that 44 pounds, 20 kilograms with the counterweight and you want to go more, that is not what this is intended for. This is intended for if you're approaching those max loads and it's really cold outside and you're just noticing that the mount's having a hard time moving around, then you can enable this mode and it should help get you through the night. Obviously, middle of August in Northeast Ohio, there's no way for me to really test this, uh, but just wanted to point it out so you guys are aware of it. This option is also available in the Sky Atlas app, uh, heavy duty mode right here, but notice it says that it reduces the slew by 50% and it increases the low capacity by 50%. That last part, the low capacity being increased by 50% is actually a typo. This should be 40. Confirm that was EWO. So at some point in time, I would assume they're going to update that with one of their future updates. Updates. Now, I'm not using the ASI Air, I'm not using the Sky Atlas app, but what I am using is the ASCOM drivers. So when you install the ASCOM drivers for the mount, and you come down and you tick your advanced button, it does not read heavy duty mode like it does in the other apps. It's max move rate. Right now it's at full speed. If I set it to half speed, it's the same thing as enabling the heavy duty mode in the other two apps that we just discussed. I just want to point out that it's there if you needed it. So before I start testing, I just wanted to tell you guys that I did add an 11 pound counterweight for my EQ6 in the rock bag on the bottom of the tripod just for stability reasons. So I want to talk a little bit about the pass-through ports on the front of the unit. Like we mentioned before, we have our 12 volt 5 amp input on the front as well as a USB port. So we can control the mount from the USB port here, that's fine but we have those saddle connections in the back, the pass-through ports. So I'm using the USB port on the saddle, but you notice the mount is powered up, but I don't have power plugged into here. And the reason for that is, is that not only is this a pass-through port to feed your mini PC or your ASI Air, but it can also be used as an input into the mount. So with all the gear that I have riding on top of the telescope and not wanting to take everything down and rewire it, because again, this is on loan from ZWO, and this is all configured for my EQR6, with my mini PC, my powered USB, hub my pegasus power box you know my guy camera my my cold astronomy camera all this stuff up here will exceed that three amps and that's all this port is rated for the front one is rated for five amps but the back one is only rated for three i put this on my desktop power supply and it was it was showing me about three and a half amps and that wasn't even with everything running 100 percent. so i didn't want to take the chance found out that i could in fact power the mount from here and ZWO said that was absolutely okay to do, so that was great. So now this line here is going down to my power supply, which feeds my Pegasus power box, and the Pegasus power box feeds everything else, including the line down into the mount. And it might be hard to see, but I do have a USB cable running down into the saddle too, so everything is up on the saddle in declination. The only thing I have to worry about getting snagged would again be my power cable that comes up, and that's got plenty of room to slew in all directions without getting hung up on anything. So the hand controller that to me looks like the old Nintendo Wii nunchuck controller that uh, the kids used to have when they were younger just simply plugs into the HC port on the front. So when you first plug it in, the red light underneath the word fast will come on and that is just telling you your slew rate basically. So using the joystick, you can move this north, south, east, and west as well as up into the corners if you need to. So it'll rotate in both declination and right ascension simultaneously. 
If you click on the joystick, that red light goes off, which means you're in a slower mode now, and then you can make micro adjustments. Not gonna be able to see that in the video, but if you're looking through your camera or through an eyepiece, you absolutely will see, especially at this magnification, that micro movement. The button label T is for tracking. We hit that and tracking starts. And then the bottom button here with a little reset symbol on it, if you long press that, it will reset the mount back to the home position. Just a couple more things I wanna go over before we start testing is, obviously I use Nina for my acquisition software. So I'm using the ASCOM drivers for the mount so Nina can communicate with it. The go home option is the position that it'll put the scope in that I just showed you with the hand controller. So same thing, if I click go home, the mount will return to that home position. The park is something different. It'll actually slew the scope horizontally to the ground. And right now there's no way of changing that. I have spoken with ZWO about the possibility of setting a custom park position. I indicated to him that it would be very useful for a lot of people, especially those of you that have observatories, to be able to slew the scope to whatever position that you want and then come in and set that park position. So every time you click park in here or you send the park position from Nina or any other ASCOM compliant software, then it would park in the position that you want it to go into. The second thing that I wanted to go over is if we tick our advanced button. This is related to the meridian flip. Down here, the meridian track setting, I have it set to stop tracking at five degrees after meridian meridian by default this is not set so what happens is is when you hit meridian the ASCOM driver will stop the tracking of the mount and that causes a problem because Nina when it issues the meridian flip command it will only work if the mount is currently tracking so if the mount stopped tracking and Nina sends the flip command it's just not going to work so to allow the meridian flip to work correctly through Nina I have my stop tracking set at five degrees after the meridian. Your value that you put in here will vary, right? Just don't put five degrees in. That gives me about 15 minutes after the meridian before it would actually stop tracking. And that works with my Edge HD eight inch. If you have something larger, like a longer refractor, you may not be able to go that far, but you need to figure out where to allow this to keep tracking past the meridian in order for Nina to work. Uh, the other good thing about this that I like about it, and this is the same thing that we have in the EQ mod or the EQ6, is it's a safety net. If Nina was to crash, and I did one time last year have this happen, Nina actually locked up on me and the mount was still tracking. I had limits set in EQ mod. So when it reached a certain point, tracking actually stopped. So I didn't crash into my tripod legs. This is the same thing. That's our safety net with that as well. So my first round of testing is with the Hyperstar. Since my guiding system uses an off-axis guider, there will be no guiding when I run the Hyperstar. So we'll run through a few different exposures and take a look at the stars to get started just to show you i'm here doing my polar alignment so we've got 32 arc seconds of error which is pretty good i'm happy with that this is a 10 second exposure on the screen now and i'm just starting my 30 second exposure don't expect any issues if there were issues then that's not a good thing but so there's our 30 second exposure and we'll get in there and zoom up on the stars a little bit and take a look at some of these things and make sure they're nice and round we don't see any trailing and that looks good so far so now we'll move on to a 60 second exposure and again examine the stars make sure they look as we expect them to be all right so 60 second exposure is complete it is stretching it currently and once again we'll zoom in and take a look at our stars and just like the 30 second one, they look nice and tight. I don't see any trailing or egging. Now I'm gonna bump up to 120 second. Even my EQ6 struggles with this. That's when I start seeing the egg shaped stars. So we'll see how the AM5 handles that. All right, so two minute exposure is complete. And if we zoom in once again, take a look at some of these stars, you can see they are slightly egg shaped. So, I mean, that's expected with, with any tracking mount. That's why we guide, right? So we can go longer exposures. Okay, so on my second night of testing, I ran the scope in its native configuration, guided with my off-axis guider. I'll show you guys here real quick that I started my polar alignment, again, within Nina using the three-point polar alignment utility, and got it dialed in just under an arc second. So again, happy with that. And then I jumped into PhD, slewed over to the proper area of the sky so we could run the calibration, clicked the calibrate button, and just waited for it to complete. Once the calibration result was finished and it said it was acceptable, I closed it and then I jumped over into the guiding assistant and started that up and let that run for approximately five minutes. And once that was done, click stop and let it do all of its calculations for measuring backlash. It'll come back and give us recommendations for settings, which I chose to accept. So the, the RA minimum movement 
the deck minimum movement, and then also the declination backlash. And I know some of you wanted to see the backlash graph, so I'll show that here. The white line obviously shows what's ideal, and the red is showing you what is measured. Let's click clear right here just so we get a, a fresh reading from the start, so it doesn't include all the drifting that was happening during calibration and the guiding assistant. It's already down around 0.42, so that's looking real good right out of the gate. But obviously, how does it perform through a whole night's session? And just to show you with the session, I am dithering. These are 480 second exposures. I'm dithering after each and every exposure. So the session has been started. Our first sub is almost complete. And so far we're still hovering sub arc seconds. So we're at 0.43 right now, which I'm very happy with. The EQ6, it was pretty rare that I would see it that low, but I was always sub arc second with the EQ6 as well. I, I love my Skywatcher mount. All right, so here's the first exposure coming in. It's looking really good. You can see down the graph below the white arrows indicating that it's now dithering. You can also see that on the left hand side where it shows dither and it's waiting for a PhD2 to settle currently. You can zoom in a little bit just to take a look at our stars. Again, this is an eight minute exposure and the stars look nice and round and we're moving into our second exposure now. It's got past the first dithering between the two exposures, so that's good. So after eight minutes and about 30 seconds into the second exposure, our total error is still in the 0.4s, but obviously we wanna see that last throughout the night. So I have grabbed the log file from PHD and using PHD2's log viewer, we can take a look at what happened throughout the night. I was battling a little bit of poor transparency a couple hours into the night, and it also looks like some clouds rolled in later in the morning, so that's why there's so many entries in here, but you can see our calibration entry here first. And as we click through them, this again was part of the calibration or the guiding assistant, I believe with it drifting this way. But if we go down, I mean, you can click through all these obviously, but if we go down to one of the larger ones, 44 minutes and 13 seconds and look down at our stats here and we are running at 0.54 for that 45 minutes. And then the next longest one I have here is an hour and 16 and same thing it's showing 0.53. Um, I'm not gonna pretend like I know everything that's going on in this graph from these logs but what i will do is leave a link in the description so if you have an interest you can pull a log down you can examine it yourself if there's any useful data in there for you then you know it's it's yours for the taking okay so on my third night of testing i ran with my dot 7x reducer from celestron guided again with the oag and just to show you guys we'll go into my polar alignment okay so 24 arc seconds on my polar alignment i'm happy with that we're going to jump right over in the PHD2, start the calibration assistant, hit the slew button to get it pointing to the right area of the sky, and then start the calibration. We'll let that run for a few minutes and then come back when it completes. Okay, calibration is finished and it says the results are acceptable, so I'm going to go ahead and cancel out of this to close the assistant and then jump over into the guiding assistant next. Again, I'm going to let this run for about five minutes. And once it's complete, we'll hit the stop button so it measures the backlash and goes through all of its checks and balances for us just like last time. And when it's finished, I'm just going to accept the recommendations for the RA minimum movement, the deck minimum movement, and then also the deck backlash. And once again, I'll show you the backlash graph. White line is ideal. Guiding assistant closed. We'll take a look at our guiding numbers. I'm going to clear the graph that's currently in there because it went way crazy during the calibration assistant just so we get a good number. Um, we'll let that run for a few minutes. Right now we're at 0.25, which is really good. And then it's 0.52. So it's fluctuating a little bit, but we're still under that one arc second. I've started my imaging session now. I'm running eight minute exposures again. Uh, we're just coming up on the first exposure, 755 down in the left hand corner there you can see. Our guiding's currently running at 0.43 arc seconds, total RMS error. And there's the Pac-Man Nebula, one single eight minute exposure. Zoom in a little bit just to take a look at the stars and they look really good to me. So, I mean, we're guiding at 0.43 still, but again, I know this is just a moment in time. You can see the numbers match both in PHD2 as well as and Nina. So like I said, that was just a moment in time showing you those numbers. So again, here's the log file for the PHD2 session that night. I'll also leave this link down in the description so you guys can go through it yourself and take a look at what it is that you're interested in. Multiple entries in here, obviously, just like last time. You know, this one right here for 8 minutes, 29 seconds, we're showing 0.79. And then the longest session, it looked like it ran around about 0.47. Like I said, I'll give you this log file so you can do your own research on it. I'm not a numbers guy. As long as I'm under that one arc second, 
I'm generally happy. The main thing for me is how well my stars look. If the stars are round, there's no trailing or egg shapes or any other oddities due to guiding performance, I'm happy. Well, I hope you found that review helpful. I know it was long. Um, there's just so much I wanted to make sure I get into, really try to cover as much as I could. There are actually, believe it or not, things that I left out um, just because the video was already getting too long, stuff like the Sky Atlas app. Don't click away just yet, because in a couple minutes, I'm gonna show you the three images that I took during those testing nights that we went through. I first of all, I wanna say thank you to ZWO for loaning me the equipment. It's too bad it's gotta go back because I really love this little mount. I wanna thank all my channel members, both here on YouTube and on buymeacoffee.com. Without you guys, this channel probably wouldn't even be where it's at now. I appreciate everybody's support, as well as everybody that likes, comments, shares, uh, uses my affiliate links. Again, there's an affiliate link for the AM5 down in the description that helps the channel grow. But once again, thank you everybody for your support. See you on the next video, clear skies. And here are the three images that I took during testing of the review of the new AM5N mount ZWO. Thank you.